Thanks for joining us here at Faith. We hope that you're encouraged and challenged by today's message. And if you'd like to learn more about Faith, our campus locations, and how you can stay connected, check out faithishere.org right after this video. I think as God's putting pieces together right here at Faith Church, he's adding another link of, of fatherless kids and, and our ministry to Lieber Church at Lieber Prison. And we're in there. I got to meet Cyril probably about uh, six months ago now, and we began talking. God had already birthed in our heart to put a church right there in Lieber. And so now we're there. It's open. We're there every other week. They have small groups every week. And some amazing things are already happening in the lives of those uh, residents who are a part of that program there. Well, I met Cyril, and he began to share his heart for linking kids with their dads. And, uh, and, and it's the whole family system, and it's following the word of God. And uh, he, he comes from India, so you'll recognize his accent, a little, little bit of an accent, if you can't tell where he's from. But he's from India originally, uh, been to the States for about the last 25 years, now lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, and so he, and God's using him in great ways to open up prison doors through Proverbs 22, 6 ministries. I want you to give Cyril Prabhu a warm welcome as he comes now to bring to us the word of God today. God bless you, Cyril. Amen. Great to have you here again, brother. Bless you. There you go. Thank you, Pastor. This time, I just like, uh, unlike the last two, two times, I removed my mic so that I can speak. Um, before I get started today, you know, I'd like to start with uh, some lighter note. There was this uh, two travelers on the plane, <clears throat> and uh, one of them is a very educated man, and the other one who is sitting there is probably not as educated as he is, right? And so they were sitting on this plane for hours now, and they are not talking to each other. You know how like when you're traveling and you don't want to talk to the person next to you, right? The same way here, they didn't want to talk to each other, and then the educated man wanted to have a conversation with him, right? So he said, you know, let's, let's have like a small game. And I said, like, okay. The, the, the man said, okay, no problem. And uh, he said, I'll ask you a question, and if you don't know the answer, you give me $5. And you ask me a question, if I don't know the answer, I will give you $500. The guy said, this sounds like a great deal, you know? So the, the educated man was so sure he can answer all the questions, right? So the first question, he asked this, this man, you know, about like, a, you know, how far is earth from the sun? Right? He didn't know the answer, okay? So... He just gave $5 to him. So then he turned around to ask the educated man, what animal that has six legs, five ears, and four eyes? And this educated man kept thinking and thinking and thinking. He could not find the answer. So he gave the $500 to him. So after he got the $500, he just asked this man, oh man, I didn't know the answer. What's this animal? And he gave the $5 back. <laughs> like I said, this has absolutely nothing to do with my message this morning. <laughs> oh, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come before your throne of grace one more time this morning. Father, I pray that even the moments that like this, that you give it to us, Father God, to come to your throne room and just like pour ourselves before you, Father God. We are like an open book for you. God, you know what is going on in our lives. Even this morning, I pray, Father, whoever has come here today morning with a burden in their heart, God, I pray that you will put your nail-pierced hand upon their situation and that they will see and feel the tug of the Father. They will feel close proximity to you this morning, that they will listen to you, Father God, for all of their needs. 
God, if there is anyone here that's heavy in their heart because of something that's going on in their family this morning, any brokenness, Father God, you know. God, I pray that you will put on the garment of praise. Change their clothing, Father God. Change my clothing, Father God, this morning. That the train of your robes will cover everything that we do. God, we send this morning into your mighty hands. You take the glory and honor. In Jesus' name I pray, Father, for your glory. Amen. All right, so this morning, the message that I'm going to be talking about is the Father's heart. You know, a lot of times, you know, we think about, um, you know, the, the, the situations that we run into with the single moms. Pastor talked about the single moms, you know, last week. You know, the unit, the family unit that God made was to have a husband, wife, and children. That was, you know, this was his divine purpose. When he built the families, that's how he built. He just wanted to have union of their spirit as they go through this life. If something bad happens in their life, they cannot face them all by themselves. Husbands needs wife and wives needs husband to help each other get through. And the children need the father and mother, right? But here, in this country right now, we have a problem. Our problem is that 25 million households in this country don't have fathers at home. They wake up and they don't see the husbands at home in 25 million households in this country. They wake up and see that when they go to the, the, the football games and the, you know, and the soccer games and, the, and the, you know, the tennis games, there is no father left behind. And so, if you have your Bibles, I would like for you to go to Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 4, verse 6. This problem was in God's mind right before he finished the Old Testament. This was, you know, in God's mind. This was the last verse in the Old Testament that says, I will, he will turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children and hearts of the children towards their fathers, lest I will come and strike this earth with a curse. God says... If the heart of the father is not towards their children or children towards their father, that is one of the worst equations that we can find. You know, the thing is, when God made this thing, I was thinking, was this a problem when this Bible was written 2,000 years ago, when this passage was written even before 2,000 years? Like, this was a problem then, and this is a problem now. The fathers have to take the rightful roles in the families. The husbands have to take the rightful roles in the families, without which the family will disintegrate. And that's what God thinks and says, that it is a curse. And it, it, as, as we look at this, and we see, the Bible says, He will turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children. The he, for a long time, I was thinking, God, God will turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children, or children's heart towards the father. But no, the he, the hitch in that he is a lowercase, which means like it's not God who's going to turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children. There is something more to it. And so, when you read one verse about that, it says, in the last dreadful days, in the last days, I will send my prophet Elijah, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children, and children towards their fathers. And I'm thinking, why Elijah? Why not Jacob? Why not Abraham? Why not Solomon? The reason why would you, God, of all the millions of people that you could think of, you were thinking of Elijah at this moment in time? And that's when it stuck that Elijah is not the norm 
of those days. And, and the way we find that is in James chapter 5, verse 17. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. What is God saying? God wants to do, give this very important portion of this world's curse, this pivotal point of a world being cursed or not, you know, has to be decided by a one who gets on his knees and starts to pray. God's not going to give because this is like a much more important for him. He's not going to give it to somebody who would just like a swan squander this issue. And that's why he was looking back and forth and he found Elijah. Today, I do not know how many of you have an Elijah in your life. You know, you need to have an Elijah in your life. You need to be an Elijah for somebody else. The Bible says in, you know, there is a, a post, a, a, a doorpost where God has left a watchman for the city. And you are that watchman. The watchman has to be watching all the time. And the king talks only to the watchman of the city because the watchman brings the warning message to the city. And God will not speak to anybody but the one whose heart is crying out to him. Right? So here we see why God, why Elijah? One more time I was just asking and then it talks about the rain that Elijah ran into. And so we go back to the first Kings chapter 18 verses 41 through 44 and I find here's what the Bible says. Elijah said to Ahab the king, go up and eat and drink for there is a sound of abundance of rain. There is a version of the Bible that says, I hear the sound of the rain. Here, there are two or three people standing next to each other, but only one guy is hearing. And the reason why that one guy is hearing is because he is the only one listening to the master's voice. The rest of them, see the thing is, when God gives you and me the vision, you know, I was telling the earlier service as well, the ministries and the, and, the, and the, you know, the efforts that the churches all go through requires an Elijah. That's why a lot of times the pastors rely on the Elijahs to support the, the ministries that are going on. We cannot go and solve this problem. If the problems on this earth can be solved with money, we would have solved many of the problems. You know, the thing is, so far, we have given to Africa $12 trillion. We have given to Africa $12 trillion as donations. Right? A country called China is only worth $11.9 trillion. We have given more than what China's GDP is to a country called Africa, and Africa still remains the same. If the problem could have solved the country's issues that are going on. It would have solved by now, but the problem's still there because it's not the issue of money. It's the issue of heart. It's the issue of God not being there. It's the issue of like a we taking God lightly. The thing is like we don't even have prayers in the school. We don't even have prayers in public places. We don't even give God the reverence that the God needs today. And if we don't give the God the reverence, how can we expect God to show up? When we have issues. And here is a prophet. And this prophet already knows that there is going to be a rain coming. And then on top of that, the Bible says, Right after Elijah went up to the Mount Carmel, top of Mount Carmel, and he bowed down to the ground and he put his face in between the knees and he started praying. You know, he put this head right here and he was just praying. 
like, you know, God, I just cannot believe this is happening to, to this nation. We don't have rain for three and a half years. We cannot be praying lightly when we don't have rain. Can you imagine this country without electricity for three and a half years? Can you imagine you not having a water for three and a half years? Can you imagine you not having a, 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 you know, basic necessity for three and a half years? The crops don't grow. Here is a man of God just like on his knees crying out to God and saying, God, bring me back the rain. And right there, you know, right when he was praying, you know, he tells his servant, go look out and see if there is any sign of a rain. And he goes out and he looks out and he finds absolutely nothing. Sometimes, you know, God gives you and me the vision and we get to this place. We trust God and we show up for God. And, you know, we are in a place where we are asking God, God, show up here. You're not here. God has never been late when we are in problem. God would never be giving up on us. God will never, you know, have a no-show. There is absolutely, you know, no way the God of this universe will let you and me, you know, stand out there and just not show up. I was one time going to Texas, Houston, Texas. I was supposed to get the money, um, you know, when I land there. The man who was supposed to write the check said, I'm going to put the money in there. The event is supposed to happen two days from now, from that point. And so I show up at this place, right? And I'm expecting the money to show up. <laughs> I get off from the airport. I was expecting the money to be there. And I look at the bank account. The bank account still remains the same. Zero. <laughs> and I'm thinking, God, I cannot even get out of this airport now. I'm stuck here. I don't have money to go to the airport. And I go to this Alamo. And one of the things that, uh, you know, I'm going to talk about Proverbs 2 to 6 in a minute. I will talk about, you know, some of the principles that we follow in Proverbs 2 to 6 where, you know, we don't have credit card for this ministry. We don't swipe credit card for running this ministry. So I don't even have a credit card. You know, the money has to be there to get the car. I show up and I took one of the cards, I know this is not a credit card. And I swipe the card at the Alamo. Before you leave, if you don't trust me, I want you to stop by and ask me to show, the, show this picture to you. When I swipe the card, something happened, a mistake happened. And there was absolutely zero dollars taken out of my car, card, and I walked out with the car. I'm not, saying, I'm not saying this to make anything up. I have a picture, evidence of this. My God will never, ever leave you alone or forsake you. When you step up into the ground and you show up for the God, you give a cup of water for, uh, in his name, he will never take the cup of water that you gave for granted. <laughs> Next day, the event happened. Everything was paid off. There are so many times... I run into a place where I need that. Four, four months ago, I needed $35,000. I didn't know what to do. I was just waiting on the Lord. The next day morning, somebody put this on a, a LinkedIn, and people were giving money like a $50 and $25. By afternoon, somebody called me and said, Cyril, I heard you need this money because the fees needed to be paid for our students, and I needed $35,000. This guy said, here's $20,000. And I'm still in awe of like what is happening. And Stacy Foundation from Florida called and said, we'll match dollar to a dollar. I'm telling you, not that money is important. Money is important, but you know, not that important. When we show up for the Lord, you know, God will show up for you. And that's what is happening here. You know, he's looking for the rain because if he has wrongly prophesied at this point he is going to get killed by the king there is no way that he's going to survive this because of this you know and plus what he has a reverence for the lord he goes to the lord in prayer 
And then I was amazed by this. This man of God, you know, not only he prayed, not only the rain came, you know, when he was praying, you know, the rain comes and then he runs out before the king to tell the king. Why? Because God has given Elijah, the spirit of Elijah, this kind of like a fervency is what God is looking for in these last days. That's why in John 1, it talks about like in the last days, I'm going to pour the spirit of Elijah upon you. And you will turn the hearts of the fathers towards the children and hearts of the children towards the father. Why is this issue so important? Why is fatherlessness so important? The fact that the father's not showing up at home and raising these children. 85% of the men and women that are serving time in the prison today grew up without fathers. 85% of these men and women did not grow up with fathers. If you don't have a father at home, your probability of going into prison is about 82%. If you were a father, didn't show up in your house, the probability of your child going into prison is about 82%. And if you happen to be in a prison. And so, my point this morning is this. All these issues were so much circled around fathers not being home. And the God of this universe is talking about how do we address this? And the only way that we can address this is when we get on our knees and ask the God of this universe to come real before us. Proverbs 2 to 6, that's what I'm going to be talking about in the next 10, 15 minutes, you know. And the, the, the thing is, uh, people ask, like, why Proverbs 2 to 6? What is up with Proverbs 2 to 6? Is this a prison ministry? Okay, so the, the thing is, that the worst Proverbs... 2 to 6 is from the Proverbs 20 to 6. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. And the reason why we started this ministry is this. We find a lot of these children that has a father, a mother in prison, ends up in prison. R nearly 82% of these children ends up being in a prison. And so when we started this whole journey of Proverbs 2 to 6, what we found out is this that not only that these children are, are ending up in prison, but also they're getting pregnant at a young age. They're getting dropped out of school at a young age. So our goal of Proverbs 2 to 6 is very simple, is to break generational recidivism. Just because a father is in prison doesn't mean that children needs to show up in prison. There was a kid in, in Charlotte, in the west side of Charlotte, she writes an uh, English essay that says, when I go to prison. Because she has seen her dad goes to prison, because she has seen her uncles go to prison, because she has seen her grandpa go to prison, she thinks it's a norm to go to prison. Houston, Texas has a, you know, the, the, is a, one of the largest city in the world is also the largest in incarcerating people, the number one city in the world for incarcerating people. This country is only 5% of world's population, but we have 25% of world's incarceration. We have put so many people into prison. And now, you know, we are paying the price for it because we have created a cycle. We have created an engine. This engine is going to produce more and more and more and more. Unless we step in the middle like an Elijah, pray over these children and help these children break this cycle. This cycle is going to continue. And they know this. About $89 billion every single year goes into prisons and corrections. $89 billion is a money that we will not recover from anywhere goes into prisons and corrections and we need to put an end to it. And the only way that we can put an end to it is not with money. It's with the word of God. 
It's with the, the, the redemption that comes through the word of God. It is through the Christ showing up. When my Savior, here's, the, here's another story. They found out when the archaeologists were, you know, digging through, and they found out some expensive toilets in Israel, right? When they took those toilets out, they found something unique about these toilets. Oftentimes, the toilets have a hole at the bottom, right? But these toilets had a hole at the bottom, and they also had a hole in the sides. So they were wondering, why do we have a hole on the sides? The hole at the bottom makes sense for it to flush, right? Why is there a hole in the side, right? They found out in those days, the people were hired to wash the rich people's back after they go to the toilet. And so this became a profession. And the Romans actually had soldiers hired to do this job. And they not only hired the soldiers to do this job, but they gave them some tools to do this job. This became like a cleaning service, right? And so here, the Roman soldiers were given a sponge and a stick and a, a bucket of vinegar as an antibiotic. So they just used this to wash not only the people's back, but they also used to, to wash the, the bathrooms of the rich people. When my Savior was on the cross, there was a soldier standing there with a stick and a sponge and a bucket of vinegar. And when he said he was thirsty, he shoved that sponge in my Savior's mouth. And my Savior, who knew what it was, the Bible says, you can go look at the Bible. It's a bucket of gall, human waste, in a vinegar. And he shoved that in my Savior's mouth. And my Father, who said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they're doing, after he was shoved this sponge in that Savior's mouth. So what Proverbs 2 to 6 is doing is to bring that God real in the lives of these children and these fathers, this forgiveness that God went through to give these soldiers and the people and that uh, generations from there has to become real in front of these fathers. So here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to run a video to show you what we do inside the prisons. These fathers are writing letters asking for forgiveness from their children. 70% of our children that's in the program are below the age 10. The fathers stand up in a line because oftentimes the kids don't even know how the fathers look. They haven't seen him in seven years, 10 years. These fathers cherish these moments because they never get a chance to hug their children or tell them how much they love them. And the thing what matters the most here is how much they both long to be with each other. So it's an event that goes for seven, eight hours where the fathers get a chance to play with their children. And the fathers can be fathers to their children. By afternoon, we turn that place into a picnic area. They get a chance to eat with their kids, play with them, celebrate all their missed birthdays. The time that they spend there is so electrifying. There is no words I can say to even define 
the happiness index of this room. And so we don't want these kids to lose that. And so what we do, we take portraits by afternoon, change the dress of the father to just look like the kid for one day. so that the fathers can write a letter on the back of the print and the kids take home by afternoon we turn that place into a worship center in the years we have given 33 children baptized like this right when the services are going on the father is getting baptized and the fathers at this point ready to get on their knees and ask for forgiveness by washing their children's feet. And the fathers take with one child at a time and read the letter that they wrote in that morning asking for forgiveness from their children. Just because that father has asked for forgiveness everything's not going to change. That's why the God of this universe has to be real to start putting a medicine in the hearts of these children. By this time, seven, eight hours has gone by. after six or seven hours and the kids after six or seven hours don't want to leave their dads and the thing is this because of this kind of reconciliation and restoration we've done a lot of work in prisons and we've done a lot of you know damage to these children and these families, we haven't been real to them. And that's why, you know, we still continue to grow this prison population more and more and more and more. And we need to put an end to this. And the thing is this, like when you think about these prisons and systems, you know, we always think it's like a, it's an African-American problem or a Hispanic problem or, you know, we're talking about like a, you know, oh, it's a drug problem. No, 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 no. The issue of these prisons growing up all stems down to only one problem, fathers not being at home. If we can bring the fathers back into the lives of these children, we will bring the crime in this nation down. The second issue that we are trying to address is bring education back into the lives of these children. We have lost the sight of education in this country. We have lost the vision for education. We are spending so much money on things that are not educational related. And so we have one out of eight kids that goes to elementary school, drops out of school without finishing high school. That's 6.6 .6 million children dropping out of school every single year. Unless we step in, unless we bring, you know, the education back into their lives, you know, these children are going to repeat whatever their father or mother has done. We need to give them a platform for them to elevate. So when we started this ministry in 2012, we could not find one kid that could go to college. One kid. We had 59 kids between the age 15 and 18, but we could not find one kid that could go to college. Out of the 59, 30 were already in prison. We were late getting into their life. 19 were pregnant. 10 of them were doing 6th and 7th grade at the age of 15 through 17. We could not find one kid. It's because of my father showing up in these prisons, helping these fathers to get on their knees and wash their children's feet and ask for forgiveness. When Christ did that to his disciples, something changed in that room. The same thing will happen when these fathers are touching the children's feet and crying over and washing their feet 
and asking for forgiveness. And that's what's going to happen here on the first week of May. About three, four miles from here in Libor Correctional, we're going to bring the kids of these men into that facility for the very first time. Why? This prison has been through a lot. Labor has been through a lot. It has been through so much riot and so much escape, so much of lockdowns. These men have lost the touch of humanism in there, and we need to bring that back into their life. And the only way these kids can, can do to the father and father towards their children is to help them heal as they are healing through this process. And we are going to, you know, take these children into that facility. And the thing is, just because we give shoes to those children doesn't mean there will be a forgiveness restored. It's going to be a process. The healing is going to take time. But we need to stay with these children as they continue to grow. And as they continue to grow, we're going to find these children start to heal. People ask me, who are you and why are you doing this? And I'm going to take a few minutes to talk about this. I come from India, just like what Pastor said, you know. I grew up without father. When I was six months old, I was abandoned by my dad. And my mom, who was not educated, was able to hang on to the six-month-old baby. We, we come from the southern part of India, and she said, you know, when recently I asked her, what was that one thing that you were holding on to, you know, that, that, that you know, you did not leave me or abandon me. You could have thrown me anywhere and just lived your life, but, you know, you did not do it. And then she said, so many times the pressure was so heavy that she wanted to kill herself. And we live in the Bay of Bengal. And she said, Every time she wants to run into that water and kill herself, when the water touches her feet, she will realize, if I also go, then this boy will be abandoned as well. And she would step out of that. And because of my mom's heart and her sacrifice, somebody in Australia, Annie and Graham, found out about me in the southern part of India, sent $30, $35 every single month, I don't know if anyone knows World Vision and Compassion International, whether you send money through those kind of organizations. I was the kid on the other end. Somebody sent $30, $35 all the way to India so that one day I'll become a senior vice president in Bank of America. It was my God's grace and mercy. And what I do today is a payback for what my father has done all throughout my life. You know, God gave me a rope, and God gave me a rope so that one day I can give the rope to somebody else. So people say, <clears throat> thank you. What is up with the prisons? How did you end up being in a prison? So I'm going to take a moment to tell my story, you know. Um, I came into this country in 1993, right? And uh, any time a kid comes into this country, right, the biggest thing that uh, we all want to do, if you're coming from India, two things goes in our mind. Number one, we think this is where the milk and honey flows, okay? And the second thing is when we land here, we want to buy a computer. This is like a postman taking a walk after a day's work, right? So I ordered the computer, went to pick it up. The, the sales guy said it's $1,475. So, I was brand new in this country. I had no credit card, no debit card. So I took a $1,500 bills, went to the store. And the store guy was saying, like, uh, who brings $100 bills to the store? So I said, OK, no problem. Hold on to my $1,400. Let me go get the change for the $100. So I took this $100 bill. I'm on the streets of San Leandro, walking around, asking people, do you have a change? People are like, whoa. Why is this Asian guy running around with a $100 bill? And where did he get the $100 bill, you know? So finally I got the change, went back up. When I went back up, the guy who took my $1,400 is missing. And so I walk in, those guys told me, oh, your friends are here, come on in. So I walk in there, and then I found out 
these guys. Between the time I went to get the change and come back, the store was taken over by a bunch of guys, and they all pulled their gun up, and they're saying, face down, face down. Don't look at us, face down. In my mind, it's still not sinking the guns can shoot. Okay? A guy comes from India, there's only two things that we're thinking. Two guys actually have a power to shoot. One, Clint Eastwood in the streets of San Francisco, and the second one is a Rambo in the forest. <laughs> Nobody else can shoot the guns, you know? So I pushed their gun and I'm looking for my $1,400. They thought I'm a macho guy, did not respect their gun. So they pushed me on the floor, tied my hands to the back, my legs together, dragged me into this dark room, and I see the sales guy tied up just like me. He was an earlier customer. I almost saw the death right in front of my face. The guy had a trigger, in, a finger on the trigger, and said, this trigger has to go. Something must have happened. My God would have stopped that trigger from being pulled. And he spared my life on that day for a reason. I was given a life back to live on. And here, you know, we come out. The, after like a 40, 30, 45 minutes, I saw that, you know, these um, guys left with the $1.5 million worth of equipments that day, leaving us on the ground, tied up. Just like in the movies, we untied ourselves, called the cops, you know. And the thing is that when, uh, when we left from that room to the main room, I just realized the sales guy come running to me and said, I had your $1,400 in my pocket. They didn't check my pocket. Here's your $1,400. So <laughs> I got my money back. It was like a reality show, you know. But the thing is, that whole incident led me to look at the, the guys who put me through these issues. You know, led me to look at the prison system. Led me to look at, the, you know, how broken the system is. And I found out, you know, unless we bring Christ back into the lives of these men, you know, we don't have a redemption. And even now, you know, our ask is very simple. As you walk out of this door, in Lieber, we are doing something different, which is we have taken all the 1,200 men and we have put their names on a card. And on the back of this, we are asking you to pray for three things for their children. We don't even know how many of them have children, how many children they have, but here's what we are praying for. Number one, we don't want even one of those children ever come into prison and taste this food. Our prayer, the second one, none of these children will ever drop out of school. And third one, none of these children will ever get pregnant before they get married. And this is not going to happen this simple because this is like a very powerful strongholds in their life that's driving them into this and it's not going to happen. That's simply when David wanted to become a king and when Saul wanted to become a king, they went to Samuel. Just like that, we are here before the Samuel. Asking the faith community to come behind us because this is much bigger than what we can handle. We are asking you to put your hands upon these children. When you put your hands upon these children, God says the kingdom's righteousness flow through, through your hand. And the righteousness of God, you praying for these children is very righteous. When you touch that paper with the names on it, there's going to be angels released into the families of those children. And those children will never ever go to prison. Seal these children with the symbol of our Savior and the blood. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loosen on the earth will be loosened in heaven. You have the power and authority in your hand as you touch these papers and pray for them. We want a complete change in their life to take place. And we want a redemption to come through in their life. We are asking God not only to just like a touch this generation, we are asking God to touch the children's children. 
will not be part of the statistics. Children's children's children will not be part of the statistics. Children's 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 children. For the next 16 generation, you're going to seal that family in Christ's name. That's what you have in your hand as you're praying for. I'm going to, you know, get on my knees because I have seen ministers who would get on their knees and ask people for prayer. William Wilberforce is a man who went to India to spread the gospel. That's why we have so many in India that knows Christ because of men like William Wilberforce who would go church after church like this after he preached. He would get on his knees and he would ask the church to pray for him because there is anointing in this place. There is an anointing in your hand. There is an anointing that you're carrying and I want you to bless. And I'm going to get on my knees not only for my sake but also the hundreds of people that are working behind us. We have 5,000 children in the program. We are serving in 24 prisons today across four states. And we have 60 children in college. And the goal of this ministry is to send 1 million children to college and pay scholarship for them. And it's not going to happen, you know, for us with our own strength. It's going to happen with the community of believers like you standing up as Elijah's and praying over these children because this nation needs Christ. Second Chronicles 7.14 says, If my people who are called by my name, he's not asking for the world and the secular world. God is saying, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves, seek my face and pray and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear them from heaven I will forgive their sins and I will heal their land this land needs healing more than any time in the history of this nation what we are asking you to do this morning is to pray over the healing to come forth we were in one of the prisons doing an all night prayer Right after we finished the all-night prayer, the prison called me and said, there was like a five-mile radius from that prison that was growing thorns and thistles, started to produce fruits and vegetables that they did not plant. That happened because his saints got on, his, on their knees and asked the God of this universe to break the ground. This morning, I'm standing here asking you for the same thing that God will plow this ground and the lever will see the redemption. Let's all stand together. Extend your hand this way. Let's pray with Cyril as he kneels before us on behalf of the prisons across our land. Father, right now, we just come. We just pray, God, that special anointing upon his life, the burden that you have placed in his heart to take this gospel into every facility across this land. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, that you have dropped in his heart this Malachi for principle, Lord Jesus, that, that your desires are to turn the hearts of the kids back to the parents. And Lord, you would do a real work in these men's hearts and lives. We thank you, God, for doors that are opening up already across this state, Lord, that we can go into Libra, Lord, and we can begin to get the men and the boys together and the girls together, and they will feel a difference. Their lives will be changed. Those men will be touched, God, by even coming into contact with their own kids, that they, they will never want to go back there again so they can be united with their families at some point. Lord, I pray for those children of the, of the men that are there. God, that they will not follow on dad's footsteps, but they will follow in your footsteps, Lord Jesus, because they have been radically changed by the power of the gospel. I thank you, God. Lord, we're going to believe that none of those kids will find themselves in prison. God, that you will cover them and, and take care of them and be with them, that they will grow to call you blessed, and it will go from generation to generation to generation. We thank you, mighty God. I thank you, Lord, for this man, his vision, his heart, 
God, we pray that you will open up more doors in more states, in more prisons all across this country and across this land. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we will see the prison population literally decrease because men and women are coming to know you as Lord and Savior. We thank you. We thank you for the open door before Faith Church and the part we get to play in this. And we pray, Lord Jesus, that you will touch our hearts and use us in a mighty way. I pray there will be an Elijah anointing upon this congregation that we will pray earnestly and fervently. We'll lift these men up before you in this ministry. And we thank you, God. And we ask it in your holy, holy, mighty name. And everyone said, Amen and amen. Give the Lord praise together, church. Hallelujah.